Hi, this is Jay Stillinger. I'm pastor here at Abounding Grace Christian Church. This is the third lesson in our series entitled Foundations for Defending the Faith. In this lesson, we're going to talk about arguments for the existence of God. This is going to be the first of our arguments. We'll introduce you to all three that we're going to be dealing with in this particular lesson, but we're going to primarily teach on the first argument for the existence of God. But before we do, let's just give you a brief uh, review of last time's uh, lesson, which we talked about relative versus absolute truth. And so we dealt with the idea that there has to be an objective, transcendent kind of truth uh, that is not based upon our preference, based upon our opinions, uh, but an absolute truth that we can depend upon every time that's true for all people at all times and in every place. And I believe that we did a pretty good job in establishing the fact that truth can be known and truth does exist, real truth, absolute truth, objective truth. And so in this lesson, we're going to talk about does God exist? We've established or attempted to uh, establish that truth exists. Now we're going to talk about does God exists. And we're going to deal with some uh, uh, real scientific evidences uh, for the existence of God, uh, things that lean toward the fact that God does exist. And as we look at these things, uh, I think it's going to bless us and help us, help all of you to uh, be able to get established firmer in your faith, but also to be able to convey these things to other people that may not believe in or uh, might doubt the existence of God. One uh, Bible scholar said this, Ronald Nash, he said, even though belief in God's existence does not require arguments or proofs, it would be wrong to assume that good arguments cannot be found or that they are useless. And so again, for us who are believers, we don't have to have uh, these kinds of proofs because we have experienced Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. However, that doesn't mean that there's not others that do need proof. Remember I mentioned in another lesson uh, that much of this defense of the faith is used in order to do a bit of pre-evangelism. Unbelievers have a lot of questions and we need to be prepared uh, to give an answer to help them with those questions they have and therefore after they've received good answers for that of uh, those questions they have many times they're more open and receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ and so that is our objective in all of this and so again there are arguments for the existence of God that are very compelling, and we're going to be looking at them in just a few moments. Uh, Frank uh, Turek and Norman Geisler said in their book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist, they said this, so what does observation and induction have to do with discovering the existence of God? They state everything. Now, before I go any further, let me just explain to you what induction means. We talk about inductive arguments. An inductive argument is an argument where the conclusion, uh, based on the premises, uh, favors, is favorable toward that. In other words, uh, the conclusion is uh, that it's probable that the premises uh, lead to that conclusion. And so, in other words, when we have to do with inductive arguments, uh, the conclusion is probable. It leans toward that. It favors that. Uh, that that we are looking to. And so uh, when we talk about the existence of God, we're not going to have, uh, you know, uh, uh, proof in the sense that we can see God or touch God, uh, but we're going to have proof in the sense uh, that we're going to have evidence that points that the points to the idea that the existence of God makes more sense than the non-existence of God. As we read more in this uh, definition or in this statement, I should say, in fact, observation and induction help us investigate the ultimate religious question. Does God exist? You say, Wait a minute, how can we use observation to investigate an unobservable being called God. After all, if God is invisible and immaterial, as most Christians, Jews, and Muslims claim, then how can our senses help us gather information about Him? They ask this question, and then they give us the answer to this question. The answer, we use induction to investigate God. The same way we use it to investigate other things we can't see, by observing their effects. Note that, observing their effects. For example, we can't observe gravity directly, we can only observe its effects. Likewise, we can't observe the human mind directly, but only its effects. From those effects, we make a rational inference to the existence of a cause. And so therefore, in talking about the arguments for the existence of God, we're going to see scientific effects. We're going to see some of these uh, evidences that show uh, that there, there is a great probability that God exists from this. And as I mentioned, 
Uh, this is one way that we can prepare people's hearts to be more receptive to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now, when we come to these scientific type e evidences, uh, we come to an area of theology called natural theology. Now, to define natural theology, uh, Geisler said this in his Encyclopedia of Christian Apologetics that natural theology, theology is the study of God based on what one can know from nature. And so it's not based on what one knows from the scriptures. It's based on what one knows from nature. And so that's why it's called natural theology. In other words, by observing the effects of nature, we can conclude that the existence of God is most likely true. Another uh, scholar and philosopher, Douglas Grotei, said this in his book, Christian Apologetics. He says, natural theology consists of theistic arguments. Now remember, theism or theistic means God, all right? Uh, it's re regarding uh, God-type arguments concerning his existence, sometimes called, as we read on here, theistic proofs. They are rational arguments for the existence of a monotheistic God, or one God, that do not appeal to sacred scriptures for their cogency. And so, so again, this idea there are rational arguments not appealing to Scripture. They don't appeal to Scripture, but they appeal to the effects of nature that we see. But nevertheless, they are rational arguments that point to the probability of the existence of God. And you know, the Bible deals with this. Paul the Apostle mentioned this kind of uh, belief, that this kind of evidence, I should say, from Romans chapter 1 as we read here in verses 18 through 21. Paul says this, For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness because what may be known of God is manifest in them. For God has shown it to them for since the creation of the world his invisible attributes are clearly seen. Interesting note. His invisible attributes are clearly seen. How do you see invisible attributes? Let's read on. They are clearly seen being understood by the things which are made or understood by the things that are created. And so we look at the invisible attributes of God, even though they're invisible, we see them clearly by way of looking and observing creation. Going on, Paul says this, uh, he states, His eternal power and Godhead, or excuse me, uh, we see being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse, because although they knew God, they did not glorify Him as God, nor were thankful, but became futile in their thoughts, and their foolish hearts were darkened. Now notice this main emphasis here, for since the creation of the world, the invisible attributes are clearly seen of God as we observe these attributes in nature by that which we can see, His creation. All right, as I mentioned already, we're going to deal with three great arguments for the existence of God. There are many more arguments than just these three, but these, uh, in my mind, and many other people's minds, are the most compelling uh, arguments for the existence of God. The first one, I'm going to introduce the three to you, then we're going to come back and do the first one in this lesson today. The first one is uh, having to do with the beginning of the universe, and it's called the cosmological argument. Now, the cosmological argument is really a family of arguments, but we're going to put it in a nutshell, and we're going to see some things about this today. And then also design. In other words, the tele teleological argument, which we'll deal with in our next lesson, which is the argument for design. The universe and life in general are, are intricately designed with such precision. Uh, they, they speak of a designer, whenever you see such precise design in nature, you must logically conclude there must have been a designer. And so we're going to look at this as well, and I think that uh, you're going to be blessed by that as well. And then morality, or the moral argument, uh, which we'll deal with uh, uh, two lessons from this one, and uh, that'll be our third argument for the existence of God uh, that will help build faith in us, build confidence in us, in order to minister to other people uh, that need to see these things. And so as I mentioned, we're going to start off talking about uh, the cosmological argument or the argument toward God's beginning or excuse me, the existence, the beginning of the universe. The beginning. The universe had a beginning. Now, the cosmological argument, the universe having a beginning, uh, means this or the logical argument for it is stated in this way. Everything that had a beginning or anything or everything that begins to exist must have a cause. The universe, the second premise, the universe began to exist. Therefore, the conclusion is, therefore, the universe has a cause. And so the premises are the first two. The premises are the first two. Everything that began to exist has a cause. 
the universe began to exist, and therefore the universe has a cause. And of course, for Christians, uh, we believe that cause is God. And so as we look at these things, everything that begins to exist has a cause. That seems just normal, rational thought. I don't think anybody would, uh, basically anybody would really argue with that. Anything that begins to exist, most people would agree, not everyone, there's still those that would argue this, but most people agree uh, that that is a logical, rational conclusion. That everything that begins to exist, there had to be a cause for it to exist. The second one, though, the universe began to exist, has been something that has been up in the air for a long time. However, in recent uh, decades, recent years, it's been concluded and seen scientifically that the universe absolutely did have a beginner or it did have a beginning. And because it had a beginning, it implies there must have been a beginner, which again, we would call God. And so we're going to look at this in more detail. And we're going to look at five lines of evidence, five lines of scientific ed evidence that the universe had a beginning. Notice what some scientists have had to say. Here's a couple of them. First of all, the scientists state that it did have a beginning. The universe had a beginning. Stephen Hawking, who is a, 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 an intelligent, very bright man, very uh, genius really, but yet also a, 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 a big atheist and known to be an atheist, but yet he said this, he said this about the beginning of the universe. Almost everyone now believes that the universe and time itself had a beginning at the Big Bang. Now, don't get upset about this idea of the Big Bang. Christians should not really have trouble with the concept of a Big Bang. The only reason why Christians do have trouble, I think, is because they uh, put that together with the idea of Darwin evolution. But that's not necessary. When we talk about a Big Bang, we're talking about a beginning. We're talking about something starting. The universe began. If you want to call it a Big Bang or not, that's what cosmologists call it is the Big Bang. And so we don't have to struggle with this. There's no problem with believing in the Big Bang scripturally because for us it's just another way of expressing the beginning, the beginning of the universe. Another uh, atheistic uh, uh, scientist said this, Alexander Vil Vilenkin, he stated this way, he said, with the proof now in place, cosmologists can no longer hide behind the possibility of a past eternal universe. There's now no escape. They have to face the problem of a cosmic beginning. Now, know what he says here. They can't hide behind this anymore. They can't hide behind an eternal state. You see, before it was established scientifically that the universe had a beginning, uh, atheists took great comfort in the idea of that the universe was eternal. It was a static state. It had no beginning. There was no need, therefore, for a beginner if the universe always was. And now we're seeing, and scientists are admitting, that now they have to prepare themselves. This is a problem. The problem is, as Vilenkin says, the problem of a cosmic beginning. they got to deal with this uh, because, again, it always uh, will infer, at least, at the very least, a beginner. Something caused the universe to begin. Now, as I mentioned in a, a few minutes ago, we're we're going to look at uh, set, uh, five uh, scientific lines of evidence for the beginning of the universe. These don't have to do with Scripture, although they line up with Scripture without any problem. But notice what they are uh, as we look at some of this uh, here today. First of all, we use the acronym, and this comes from uh, uh, Turek and Geisler in their book, I Don't Have Enough Faith to Be an Atheist. Excellent book. Highly recommend it. You'd be blessed by it. Uh, they use an acronym SURGE, and each of these letters obviously uh, means something. They, they uh, uh, represent a certain aspect or a certain line of evidence for uh, the existence of God. First of all, the S. I'm going to give them all to you, then we'll go through them uh, in more detail. First of all, the S, the second law of thermodynamics. You, the universe, is expanding. Our radiation afterglow. G is great galaxy seas, and the last one is Einstein's general relativity. And so as we look at each one of these, we're going to see again that science has essentially proven that the universe had a beginning, and therefore, if it had a beginning, uh, then it has a cause and the cause most logically, uh, most rationally, would be an intelligent creator or God. All right, let's move on then and let's look at the first one. The universe had a beginning, surged the second law of thermodynamics, which basically means the universe is running down. It is running out of usable energy. Now, in order to understand this a little bit better, recognize the fact that the first law of, of thermodynamics basically states that the energy of the universe is constant. In other words, it's finite. 
There is uh, no increase in energy. There's no decrease in energy in terms of, of, of energy itself, but there is a decrease in usable energy. There's the unusable energy that's already been used up, but then there's the usable energy. And, and again, uh, it's finite, it's constant. And yet, the second law of thermodynamics says that it's running out. And so if it's running out, that denotes a beginning to the universe. Why is that? Because if the universe was infinite, that energy would have ran out by now. The fact we still have energy tells us that the universe could not have been infinite or eternal and always existed. For example, if you were to have your automobile filled with gas, you'd know that you have a finite amount of gasoline in that automobile. But if you were to leave that run running for infinity, eventually that would have ran out and it would have ran out a long time ago. An another example of this is like a flashlight. A flashlight, if you have one and you leave it on, you know that there's a finite amount of energy in those batteries, but if you leave it on slowly but surely, it's going to dim its light, its light's going to dim, and it's going to run out of energy. If it was began an uh, infinite amount of time ago, even though that doesn't really, that's not really accurately said, then it would have ran out of energy a long time ago. And so the fact that there's still energy in the world, in the universe, tells us that the universe had a beginning. And Virtually every scientist uh, would agree with that. Now, the next one in our, uh, uh, in our uh, acronym is the letter U, and that is the universe had a beginning surge, or the universe is expanding. Back in 1927, astronomer Edwin Hubble uh, d observed that the other galaxies in the universe are moving away from us. He knew this uh, because he's, as, as he, he was observing in his telescope, this powerful telescope that he had, as he was observing it, he saw red light shifts uh, in the planets, in the, in the galaxies, uh, uh, in his telescope, and the, right, the, the red light shifts indicated uh, that the universe was moving away, and they were getting further apart. The, ga the, the planets, the suns, were we're getting further apart, the stars further apart, and his conclusion from that, and rightly so, was that if they're moving away, then at one time they must have been back closer to each other and even to a point of beginning. And so he concluded from that, and really it was proven, and scientifically it made sense, that this means that if it collapsed back on us, if, the, if, the, if time were reversed and the universe would collapse back, it would, ba it would collapse back into nothing. Again, an indication of the universe having a beginning. So we have uh, S, the second law of thermodynamics, energy is running out. The second one, the universe is expanding, indicating that at one time it must have been beginning at a certain point and going out from there. And then the next part of our uh, acronym is the R, which is the radiation afterglow. You see, scientists concluded that if there was a Big Bang, if there was, let's say, an explosion of some sort that started all of this, they thought, well, there, have to, there has to be some kind of uh, radiation glow, radiation effects, or, or, or uh, some kind of remnant heat uh, that should be discovered at some point indicating that that took place sometime in history. Well, uh, these two fellows that you see here, Robert Wilson and Arnold uh, Penzias, were two scientists uh, back in 1965, and they by accident uh, discovered uh, the radiation, the radiation uh, after uh, glow, or the cosmic microwave radiation. They discovered it by accident. They actually thought uh, that, uh, uh, you know, this static they were experiencing on their antenna, you can see their antenna there uh, behind them in this photograph, they thought that the static they were experiencing must have been due to pigeons that were roosting there, and, and and droppings uh, that were there. And so they had the pigeons removed, they had the droppings all cleaned out, and it turns out they went back and looked and they still were having static problems with their antenna. And finally, after looking these things over, they concluded we have discovered something here. This radiation, this is the effect of a Big Bang. This is the effect of the universe had a, having a beginning. In fact, this sort of put a nail in the coffin as far as uh, uh, the eternal universe or an infinite universe. It really put a nail in the coffin because it was more evidence. It was evidence uh, that was phenomenal in terms of proving the uh, beginning of the universe. In fact, Robert Jastrow, an agnostic who uh, has since passed away. Uh, he was the founder of NASA's uh, Goddard Institute of Space Studies. He said this, and again, he was not a believer. He was an agnostic. He said, no explanation other than the Big Bang has, uh, has been found for the fireball radiation, as he put it, for radiation afterglow or cosmic uh, microwave radiation. He called it fireball radiation. The clincher, which has convinced almost the last doubting Thomas, is that the radiation discovered by Penzias and Wilson has exactly the pattern of wave 
wavelengths expected for the light and heat produced in a great explosion. Supporters of the steady state theory, which is referring to the eternal steady state of the universe that atheists and many scientists adhered to prior to, the, to these discoveries, he said supporters of the steady state theory have tried desperately to find an alternative explanation, but they have failed. At the present time, the Big Bang Theory has no competitors. That's a powerful statement when you think about it. And so, so far, what do we have? We have the second law of thermodynamics. The re energy is running out, proving uh, the universe had a beginning. The second one, the universe is expanding, uh, suggesting uh, that as it's going further away from us, it must at one time bend back toward us uh, to a point of beginning. And so the universe expanding, the second line of evidence. And then thirdly, the radiation afterglow or the cosmic microwave radiation or the fireball radiation shows again the, the remnant heat still out there in the universe as a result of an explosion called the Big Bang. So these evidences are just kind of building upon one another. It's a cumulative case uh, for the existence of God, uh, seeing that this has to do uh, with the universe uh, having a beginning to it, the cosmological argument. All right, as we go on with this, we come to the next letter in our acronym, and that's the letter G, Great Galaxy Seeds. If the Big Bang actually occurred, scientists believe that we should see, see slight variations or heat waves as a result with variations in the temperatures of those, of those waves of heat. And, and it took a long time for them to discover them, uh, but in 1989, the search for these ripples was intensified when NASA uh, put together and launched a $200 million satellite, uh, which was the COBE, the Cosmic Background uh, uh, Satellite, that they sent up into space. And sure enough, after a period of time, they didn't announce until 1992, George Smoot was the project director, and, and he said a number of things about this that are absolutely amazing. Uh, but he announced that they had found they had found the uh, the great galaxy seeds. He didn't use that terminology, but they had found these heat waves, these uh, uh, these uh, these variations, these ripples, if you will, uh, of heat with various temperatures in it. Again, showing and, and it's similar to if you were to drop a pebble in, into a, a still. Uh, a pond of water and where it hit ripples would go out from it this is what they expected from the explosion of the Big Bang ripples of various temperatures of heat uh, going out from there and they discovered it they discovered it as they intensified in 89 they announced it in 92 and uh, uh, George Smoot who again is an agnostic one who doesn't know whether you can believe in God or whether God exists uh, he said it's like the fingerprint of God he said he said for a religious person uh, th this is is like uh, uh, this is like seeing God's face etc and so he said a number of things about this because it was so phenomenal and again showing uh, that the beginning of the universe and evidence for it points to the idea there must have been a beginner someone who started it all and so we see a number of things pertain to this and again a Nobel Prize uh, for these individuals as well in 2006 and so uh, 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 George Smooth that's the picture of George Smooth there on his uh, book and it's a secular book, Wrinkles in Time, where he teaches and shares about uh, these uh, discoveries that he has made with his team. All right. And so we have second law of thermodynamics. We have a universe that's expanded. We have radiation afterglow. We've got great galaxy seeds or wrinkles and variations in temperature uh, of waves going out from there. And then finally, we have our last letter, which is the letter E for Einstein's uh, general relativity. Now, uh, Einstein's uh, theory of general relativity basically says this, that space, time, and matter all had to come into existence at the same time. They were interdependent. The idea uh, that they came together, they had to be in existence all at the same time, again, implied that they had to come into existence at the same time, or there was a point in time where, where it began. Space, time, and matter came into being at one particular time. That's what this basically said. And when Einstein discovered it, even before, uh, even before Hubble saw and discovered the universe expanding, uh, uh, Einstein, with his general, uh, uh, his theory of general relativity, he knew that this meant or pointed to a beginning in the universe, and he didn't like it. He found it irritating, in fact. He wanted to do something uh, to get rid of it, and so he, he kind of fudged some numbers and things in order to make it not work, uh, but yet, uh, you know, when Hubble came along, he saw the expanding universe, uh, there was no question about it, and Einstein could not deny it any longer. And so matter came into existence together with space and time, again, 
begin showing this idea of the universe having a beginning. In fact, uh, later on, I think it was in 1929, uh, Einstein went to Hubble's uh, telescope and saw it, and uh, he was convinced, and he, he wanted to know how God did it. Even though he never became a, a, a Christian, he never became a, even a, a, a monotheist, he was a pantheist, which means he believed God was in all, he still had a change in heart in terms of having to admit uh, that the universe had a beginning. Remember our cosmological argument. Everything that begins to exist Everything that begins to exist has a cause. The universe began to exist. We've seen five lines of scientific evidence for the universe beginning. Therefore, the universe had a cause. And the most rational cause of the universe would be an intelligent individual or an intelligent being who we would call God. Amen. And so these things, I think, are very powerful and lead us to, to come to the conclusion that the most likely, the most likely uh, uh, argument or the most likely conclusion is that God exists. Now, scientific, scientific evidence leads to the biblical account of creation. Here is Robert Jastrow, again an agnostic who passed away I think 2008 or thereabouts. He said this about all of these things. He said, astronomical evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. The essential element in the astronomical and biblical accounts of Genesis is the same. What a phenomenal statement by an agnostic. Now, if it was said by a Christian or even a Jewish individual, uh, you know, that would have been one thing. But this was said by a, a, an agnostic, a man who wasn't sure if anyone could know whether there was a God or not. But yet he said that the astronomical evidence points to the biblical uh, account of creation, essentially. As we look further into this, he also said in an interview one time, uh, this is what uh, Jastrow said in an interview. He said, astronomers now find they have painted themselves into a corner because they have proven by their own methods that the world began a abruptly in an act of creation to which you can trace the seeds of every star, every planet, every living thing in this cosmos and on the earth. And they have found that all this happened as a product of forces they cannot hope to discover. Now notice what he said after this, that there are what I or anyone would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. Absolutely amazing. He said, now this agnostic scientist this man who was well respected and prestigious, he said that there are what I or anyone else would have to conclude a supernatural forces at work and that those supernatural forces would be scientific, scientifically proven at this point. Well, you know what? Uh, when you think about it, supernatural means beyond the natural. It means that it's uh, further, it's, it's, it's uh, well, beyond the natural. That's supernatural, and that's exactly what he's saying. This could not happen naturally. It happens supernaturally. Again, uh, arguments for the existence of God, the cosmological argument. Now, another argument that kind of goes along with this, it's a part of this argument, is a philosophical argument that the universe had a beginning. And hopefully you'll be able to understand this. But think about this. If, if time past was infinite, if time past always was, then today would have never come. Today would have never come. Why? Because we could go to yesterday, and we could go to the day before yesterday, we could go to last week, but they would never, they'd be infinite. In other words, if, if the universe uh, never had a beginning, we would never reach this point in time because we have an end to our time. This would have been the end uh, of the timeline right now would have been the end of the timeline, and that can't happen. Infin infinity would have never brought us to this place. And so that's a philosophical evidence for the universe having a beginning. And so if the past were infinite, today could never have arrived. And that is very true. I think that there's some things that we can consider with all of this. Now, all of this lines up with the Bible. There are so many scriptures. Let me give you a few uh, scriptures that indicate that uh, time had a beginning, which again goes back to the universe having a beginning. Several different scriptures. First of all, 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 7. We speak of God's secret wisdom, a wisdom that has been hidden and that God destined for our glory before time began, Paul says. And then 2 Timothy 1.9, the Apostle Paul once again, this grace was given us in in Christ Jesus before the beginning of time. Titus 1-2, the hope of eternal life, which God promised before the beginning of time. I think you're getting the picture here. And then finally, Jude 1 and verse 25, to the only God our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen. So regarding 
the existence of God, the evidence leaves us with the following two options. Here's the two options. These are the only options we have. That is, either no one created something out of nothing, which is the atheistic view, or someone created something out of nothing, which is the theistic view. Now, I ask you the question, which of these views is most reasonable? I think the most reasonable is that, no, that someone created something out of nothing. And that someone is God. That's the only reason. Nothing comes out of nothing. I mean, you just can't do that. That doesn't work that way. And so therefore, someone created something out of nothing is the most reasonable uh, solution or the, the most reasonable conclusion uh, that we would have from that. And so a question that you can ask an atheist, if there is no God, why is there something rather than nothing at all? And see what their answer would be on that. Now, note some other things that scientists have stated. The beginning is biblical. Some other uh, individuals, Arno Penzias, one of the discoverers of the radiation afterglow, said this, The best data we have concerning the Big Bang are exactly what I would have predicted had I had nothing to go on but the five books of Moses, the Psalms, and the Bible as a whole. And then also Robert Wilson, the co-founder of the radiation afterglow, said, Certainly there was something that set it all off. I can't think of a better theory of the origin of the universe uh, to match Genesis. And so again, they're pointing back to the, the Genesis account of the universe having a beginning. George Smoot, who was uh, the, the project leader uh, that came around and, and began to discover these uh, uh, waves, these uh, uh, galaxy seeds, if you will, these waves, these heat waves, uh, he said this, there's no doubt that a parallel exists between the Big Bang as an event and the Christian notion of creation from nothing. And then I've already mentioned this quote from Robert Jastrow, but I'll mention it to you again. Now we see how astronomical ev evidence leads to a biblical view of the origin of the world. Scientists also state the beginning was out of nothing. Again, I appeal to Arno Penzias, Nobel Prize winner. The easiest way to fit the observations with the least number of parameters was one in which the universe was created out of nothing in an instant and continues to expand. And then Victor Stenger, another atheist, said the universe exploded out of nothingness. And so again, it came out of nothing, but it was someone who created it out of nothing. Scientists also state in the beginning it was supernatural and we see other things. Arthur Eddington, the beginning seems to present insuperable difficulties unless we agree to look on it as frankly supernatural. Arno Penzias astronomy leads us to a unique event, a universe which was created out of nothing, one with the very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions required to permit life and one which had an underlying, one might say, and one which has an underlying, one might say, supernatural natural plan. And this, is, uh, this statement goes over into what we're going to be dealing with in our next lesson, which is the argument for design or the teleological argument, because notice it was created out of nothing, but very delicate balance needed to provide exactly the right conditions for life. Very important and very compelling argument as well. And then Robert Jastrow again, that there are uh, what I or anyone else would call supernatural forces at work is now, I think, a scientifically proven fact. These are phenomenal statements uh, that uh, are just absolutely amazing when coming from people who are not Christians and, and many are atheists or agnostics and yet they've concluded this and, and therefore uh, they really should understand there is a God. There is a God. Now, uh, Robert Jastrow said this again, and I appeal to him again because he has so many fantastic statements. You're going to enjoy this. Notice what he said. For the scientist who has lived by his faith in the power of reason, the story ends like a bad dream. He has scaled the mountains of ignorance. He is about to conquer the highest peak. As he pulls himself over the final rock, he is greeted by a band of theologians who have been sitting there for centuries. And so, uh, praise God. Praise God. The evidence points to God. There's a number of things that it tells us about God. The cosmological argument tells us uh, that He is a supernatural God by nature. He is a powerful, incredibly powerful God to have created the entire universe. He must be eternal or self-existent. No infinite regress or causes. Uh, because He made the finite, He must have been infinite Himself and eternal Himself uh, in order to uh, be the one who did those things. And then He must be omnipresent. He created space and is not limited by 
by it. And so he's omnipresent. He's not limited by space. Also, he must be timeless and changeless. If he created time, he must be, on, be beyond time. He can't be confined by time if he created time. And he must be immaterial because it, he transcends it. He transcends space and the physical. If he created the material, he must be beyond material. He is immaterial. And he must be personal because an impersonal cannot create personality. And indeed, we find that in creation. Also, he must be necessary as everything else depends upon him. He must be infinite and singular as you cannot have two infinites. In other words, you cannot have many gods that are infinite in, in their nature. There can only be one God who's infinite. The reason why is because if you have two gods, you have differences between them. One is lacking something the other one has and vice versa. And so if you have one that is lacking something, then he is not perfect. He's not infinite. He's not complete. And so how can he be God? There can only be one infinite God uh, because there can only be one perfect perfection in that sense. And then he must be diverse, yet have unity. Be with us next time, and next time we're going to get into the second argument for the existence of God, which is the teleological argument, or the argument for design. And I know that you're going to be greatly blessed, and again, your faith is going to be built by that. Amen. God bless you now.